Um, yes, I know it's hard, you know, meeting new people and saying stuff about yourself, but I appreciate you guys doing that. Um, one of the things that's important to me is making connections and building community because um, a lot of research shows that pe people who make more connections um, are more likely to succeed in class. So I want to share this with you real quick and then we'll kind of get into uh, some uh, math. So the, uh, when you take a class, you're taking it probably because you were told to, especially if it's this kind of math class. It doesn't lead to anything. It's just a requirement for you to get your degree. So I think one of the things that instructors should do, regardless of the class, is think about what is the point of the class? Why are students being asked to do this? So this is my answer to that question, which is five reasons that five things that I think you're going to get out of this class. And I like to do this on day one, and then I like to do it at the end of the semester after we've been together for eight weeks. The first one is to be able to use Excel to be, you know, proficient and feel like you know how to do some basic things. Uh, Excel has got a lot of applicability. You know, I use it a lot as a teacher in terms of organizing things, organizing grades. I was just using it this morning to do some work on due dates and manipulate things. But even if you're not using it professionally, you can use it personally to, to organize things. And I want you to feel comfortable with that. It's a little challenging for me to not be standing next to you, sitting next to you and helping you if you have trouble with Excel. But with Zoom, we can still work on the technical side of it because for, for some of you, the technology part, you know, what button do I push? Where's that thing? That's a problem that could be an issue for you. And so it's nice to be able to get support. For every Excel assignment, I've made a video. Um, the video, one of the things that I've noticed about the videos is that when you use different platforms, like I'm on a Mac, you're in Windows, you're on a Chromebook, the Excel screen can look a little different. And so that can be challenging. But usually if you take a picture of your screen and you send it to me, I can tell you where to look for whatever thing you're looking for. So anyways, there's ways for me to help you do Excel. But to me, it's an important part of the course. And a lot of people say very positive things at the end of the course. A lot of people curse loudly during the course about Excel because it, they feel like it's hard and it's frustrating. But a lot of people say good things at the end after they've been through the whole thing. Um, number two, build social capital. Social capital is the concept that who you know matters and your relationships and your connections are a source um, of support for you. So one of the things that I think is important in college is that you are potentially developing relationships and a network of people that can, you know, not be friends or just people that you can call on if you need something. And, um, you know, I think just in regards to me, right, I'm going to be part of your social capital at the end of this experience. And um, what that means for you is that you will have built up a relationship with somebody who does math for a living. So you have questions about, you know, math stuff later in life. And you're like, and who I know that is really good at math. Oh, I have this math teacher that I could talk to. Sometimes that social capital leads to references or recommendations because you're like, I want to apply to this thing and I need somebody uh, who knows my work and knows how I operate. And, you know, this math teacher saw me work really hard for eight weeks. So there's lots of things, ways in which I become part of your social capital. But also, importantly, your colleagues in class can become part of your social capital. Now, it's harder in a virtual environment because you're not sitting next to people, you know, and that kind of that breeds camaraderie when you have those experiences in person, but there's still ways for us to connect and hear about each other. And I want to try to help you uh, experience that. Number three, the financial tools, very important. Um, 
in terms of the course, it happens at the end of unit two, but basically I want you to understand something about, you know, um, the, some of the calculations that you can make and ways that you can ask questions about um, loans in particular, because we're a society where going into debt is the norm. You know, we don't like save up $100,000 to buy a house. We buy a house on credit and then we pay back the debt or we buy a car on credit and we pay back the debt. Um, and so I think it's really important for you to have a sense of how do I calculate how much is this gonna cost me? Because one of the weird things about loans is they're not really upfront with the price tag about the cost a lot of times. They tell you the interest rate, but they don't tell you how much it's gonna cost you. They tell you you're gonna just pay this much for five years or whatever. Um, so we're going to talk about how to do some of those calculations. Number four, understand yourself as a student better. I just think this is critical. You're in college for a reason. You have a goal. Some of you are more at the beginning. Some of you are more at the end. Um, you are going to succeed based on your ability to be a successful student. That's it. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's math or English or psychology. The content is different, but being a student is a skill and it's something that you work on and you can improve. And uh, I want this class to be, you know, it's, a ch it's naturally a challenging class because it's mathematics, but I want to build in supports to help you understand yourself as a student better and just become, uh, you know, especially regarding time management and preparation prioritization, you know, how do you organize things when you have a full life and you're doing college. And then finally, combine qualitative, quantitative reasoning, you know, and that kind of gets to the heart of what the course is about. Um, we'll do questions where you have to write something as your um, answer. It's not just getting the answer five, but it's saying something about what the situation means. And then kind of one level up from that is in the Excel assignments, you have these summary questions where you have to do some writing to talk about what's happening. And then the kind of largest step up is the project where you have an opportunity to write something to talk about the situation and show what you've learned uh, in regards to these, you know, Excel uh, spreadsheets that you've done. So that's kind of the big picture, right? There's all these, these little things that we'll learn like today, how to construct a ratio, how to calculate a ratio, how to, turn that into a sentence. Those are specific little skills, but these are the big picture ticket items that we're working on. Okay. Any questions about any of that? All right. How are you feeling? Overwhelmed? Feeling all right? Okay. Um, it's, it's just hard for me to gauge how people are doing because the, the body language often tells a lot of the story. It's hard for me to see. Okay, um, so we've talked about intro, talked about the essential learnings. What is quantitative reasoning? That's the first section of the course. It's, you can look at it in the book is, uh, you know, what is quantitative reasoning? It's kind of, and I encourage you to look at that. I made a video about it as well, but I just want to give try to give a specific example that's relevant to uh, some of the discussions and the things that are happening in our society right now. So, first of all, I want to kind of divide the um, universe into opinions and facts. If I say the police are terrible that's an opinion. And our course is not going to delve into that domain of thinking. You're welcome to have opinions about the world. And I have plenty of opinions about the world. Um, and I'm not saying opinions don't matter. Uh, there's actually a part of the course where we kind of look at what people believe and what people think and think about the statistics of that and, and how we, how that can you know, how, how do we use that to inform us about what's happening in society? But in general, we're gonna be operating over on this side of things. 
the fact side. Now, in terms of facts, um, there's just staying in the same vein. If my topic is police behavior, um, I could say something that's factual, like people die uh, at the hands of the police every year. That's a fact. It's not an opinion. It's, it's a statement, and it's true. Um, it's qualitative in the sense that I did not use numbers, right? All I said was people die at the hands of the police. I didn't say how many people die. Um, so just by adding in a number, I begin to turn something from qualitative to quantitative. And that's the easiest way to understand the difference. If I say five people die at the hands of the police every year, then I've made that a quantitative statement because I've quantified, I've put a number to the action that I'm talking about. Um, it's more like a thousand people die uh, at the hands of the police every year. And it, kind of an interesting backstory on that. There's no federal organization that tracks how many people die at the hands of the police. Um, and the, the only thing that was kind of doing something like that was undercounting by about 50%. So they were saying, well, this is about 500 people, but it was when organizations, this is after Michael Brown and Ferguson uh, and news organizations realized there was no tracking mechanism for, you know, all, because you've got to think about this is an enormous country. There's lots of police departments and nobody was keeping track of all of these together. So news organizations started going out and keeping track of it. And it turned out to be, it's been very consistent for the last five years, it's been about a thousand people every year. So again, I'm moving into quantitative reasoning. Now, just to go one step further, I think, hold on, let me write this down. People die at the hands of the police. So that's qualitative and quantitative would be like about a thousand people die. So I think that if what we do, what we care about is systemic racism, inequality, injustice, then we've got to go farther. This is a starting point. We can't definitely got to go past qualitative. We got to get to quantitative. We got to quantify it, and then we need to disaggregate it. And disaggregation is where we start looking at well, how many of those people are men? How many of those people are women? How many of those people are black? How many of those people are Latinas? How many of those people are, you know, transgender, whatever. The disaggregation allows us to start to see, well, is this, um, you know, a normal thing that would happen because there's more of this type of person than this type of person, or is this group overrepresented? And um, the disaggregation is really where it becomes quite clear that there's a lot of systemic racism that's still operating in our country because things are not proportional. Um, you know, having more of this group does not mean that they experience more of this action. And so, to me, the intersection, the most basic intersection of math and the world is that the quantification is where we start to really understand the story so that we can fix the problem. We can't fix the problem if you don't know it's a problem. And the numbers have a, a, a part to play in that. So that's quantitative reasoning in a nutshell. Now, I wanna show you this graphic because this is kind of a joke, but um, this is how I think about quantitative reasoning problems. There's a layer, and this is a big difference from a math class. Like if you're used to a math class being like, what is three times four plus 19? That's a computation question where all you have to do is do the math, right? Now there might be a trick like, oh, you gotta add before you multiply or uh, order of operations, but it's just math, right? And then there's an answer and that's it. But our class is different because you're gonna have words that you have to interpret. That's a layer that you have to get through to get to the math, you do the math, and then you have to recontextualize. These two layers, which are the buns of the cheeseburger, um, are 
the part that are really the most difficult. Uh, the math tends to be straightforward in terms, it's not, again, we're not manipulating equations. We're not solving for X for the most part. Um, a lot of times it's just multiply or divide or add or subtract or maybe do two steps or something, right? But it's not like a crazy sequence of steps. It's being comfortable enough to understand what's happening. So when I read the words, I know what I'm being asked to do. And then at the end of the math process, coming back and saying, well, what does that actually mean? Now, that's really what makes this challenging. So let's go ahead and get started with some ratios. Well, first, let me just pause. See if anybody has questions or comments or things they want to say. <laughs> 